Sonny Crouch, well known to many of you, I know, fantastic supporter of the university. Um, one of the reasons that the Docklands campus is here is Sonny Crouch. One of the reasons that we're able to sit in this building here today is because of the work that Sonny Crouch did in developing this part of the campus. So Sonny's had a long and successful career and a long um, attachment to the university and been fantastic for us. But her career has spanned business, marketing, education, tourism, regeneration, heritage, the arts and the voluntary sector. In short, Sonny has had a distinguished record in the leadership, planning and successful delivery of what you could say is really transformational regeneration initiatives, including uh, the pioneering London Docklands Development Corporation, which was responsible for the whole regeneration of East London, including Canary Wharf, uh, which Sonny was majorly involved in from its very inception. Um, Sonny helped to establish the first visitor economy. For her work in Portsmouth, she is credited with transforming the economy of the city. She was also the entrepreneurial founding chairman of Visit East London and of Great British Cities and an advisor to the cities of Madrid, Beirut, Sydney and Shanghai. So you can't get much more sort of transnational and global than that. More recently, she was appointed as the chairperson of Portsmouth Historic Dockyard and is still uh, a governor of the University of East London and we hope will continue to be so for some considerable time. Um, with us, she chairs the Capital Project Steering Group where she has overseen, really over the last eight years, if you uh, really put everything together, that's about £200 million worth of new development in infrastructure and estate at this university. She is also the founder of the Chair of the Centre of Excellence for uh, Women Entrepreneurs and Women Entrepreneurship and some of you will be uh, well aware of the work uh, of Siwi uh, and its successes. Until recently, Sunny was the director responsible for mixed use regeneration projects in East London and a non-exec director of Thurrock Thames Gateway Development Corporation and Places for People, which is a major housing and regeneration group. Sunny's achievements have earned her, quite deservedly, many awards, including the first Cities Award from the English Tourist Board for Portsmouth, uh, the first Docklands Business Person of the Year Award, which is a fantastic achievement, um, the Tourism Society Award for Lifetime Achievement, and the first Shine Award for being an inspiration to other women. She has been honoured uh, with an OBE for Business, Regeneration and Tourism, uh, an honorary doctorate in Business uh, Administration, uh, and with the London Borough of Tower Hamlets, a Civic Award for Contributions to Business and the Community. So you can see, not just uh, a very distinguished speaker, but a very well recognised and rewarded uh, speaker, quite rightly. Her topic tonight is women in the boardroom, how to get your knees under the boardroom type of table. So that's uh, quite an intriguing title. And I think like most of you, I'm curious to hear more. So with no further ado, thank you very much, Sonny Crouch. Well, thank you for the introduction, John. And it really is a, a very great pleasure to come and speak to you all today. Um, I hope you'll find something interesting in what I have to say. But you have taken the trouble to come along tonight, which I think means some of you want to know something about getting your knees under the boardroom table, and only you know what. So what I just need you to take 30 seconds to do now is think about what question you'd like to ask me at the end, because I probably won't answer it, because this is the presentation I've prepared not the question you want to ask. So do feel free to tailor this event to the questions you want to ask and you get your chance <coughs> to do that at the end. Now you do not have to take notes because if you want a copy of this presentation you can have it. And the reason I don't really like people taking copious notes 
is because a part of my career I was actually a lecturer in a university and somebody told me that a lecture is a situation in which words pass from the mouth of the lecturer to the pen of the student without going through the mind of either. <laughs> and I think, oh, oh. So please don't try and keep notes. But obviously, if I say something especially interesting and relevant to you, then you should jot that down. But uh, take in a copy of what I'm saying. Don't do it. Um, now, for those of you who've just come in, uh, I did say to uh, your better performing part of the audience, uh, the, one of the bits of advice I would give you if you want to be a board member is never be late. So you're all most welcome. Um, now, the way I'm going to structure this, I've, I've taken some, a few slides, it's a book, 38 pages long, but I've just taken a few slides out of an annual research analysis that's done by a company called MM&K. And, and um, Oh, it makes a rude remark if I try and go the wrong way. <laughs> um, right, and uh, so they publish this survey uh, every year, and um, they have done so this year, and the results of it cost you £85 to get the book, but I did go to the launch of it uh, this year, and uh, so I just realised it was so much useful for, to me, they kindly uh, allowed me to have some of the stuff uh, to use today. And uh, this, so this information I'm going to show you first comes from 506 current directors of current <coughs> British boards. And of those, 316 were the chairman, they are all chairman, and 186 were non exec directors. And between them, because many non executive directors, it's called a portfolio career, and as you can hear, for part of my career, well now indeed, I have a portfolio career. And what a portfolio career means is that you have more than one non-executive directorship. And you can do that because none of them is full time. So it's the most enormous fun because you can pick and choose what you want to do. And if it doesn't sound like fun, don't jolly well do it. So, hey, what could be nicer than that? Um, so there are two kinds of director, which I hope you all know, but I'm just saying it in case. There are the executive directors. Those are the people who are employed in the business and they actually do the work. And then there are non-executive directors, and non-executive, you don't have to execute anything. The non-executive directors do not actually do the work. In fact, when I'm being a bit flippant, and I wouldn't want to be flippant to an audience like this, and people ask me, you know, why? Why are you a non-executive director? Well, as you might have guessed already, I'm rather an opinionated person. And can you think of anything more wonderful than turning up at meetings, and apart from charitable things, you're paid to, turning up a meeting and somebody pays you to shoot your mouth off and then it's their job to toddle off and do whatever you said. Hey, is that heaven or is that heaven? It's pretty good. Um, so, today I'm concentrating on non-executive directors. So that's quite a long way up the gravy chain. You probably have had to be a manager before you get to be a director, but not necessarily. And I'll explain how some of you could be doing that now. So the purpose, what are non-executive directors there for if they don't do anything? Well, the answer is they're selected because they have some special thing, and it's a whole range of things it could be, which we'll have a look at in a minute. They have some special things that they bring to the board. The board is the, is the part of the organization that runs the whole company, makes all the decisions about it. Companies, on the whole, are funded by shareholders. That is to say, the people who've got their money in the business and therefore want a return on the money they've put in. So the non-execs are there in order to protect the interest of the shareholders. Because the interests of the shareholders are not necessarily the same as the interests of the executive directors. So, for example, 
the executive directors, the people in the business, might think, oh, what a jolly good idea, chaps, let's all give ourselves a huge pay rise. And from the executive director's point of view, that is definitely in their interest, so they vote for it. But if you're representing the shareholders, that's the people whose money you're spending in all this activity you are doing, would they think it's a good idea for the money to be spent on more and more money for the executives and therefore less on doing the job? And this is even more important when you're on boards where um, there aren't shareholders. So for example, if you're on a hospital board of governors where there aren't any shareholders, but the more money you spend on the executive and the management, the less you can spend on patients. So the non-executive directors will be very alert to that. And the same thing is too in charities and education, anywhere where, where there are no direct shareholders, but there are certainly stakeholders, people to whom it is your business to ensure that the business is doing the best it can for them. So that's what our non-executive directors are, and I'm assuming for the rest of the day that we all want to be non-executive directors, if not now, one day. Right, well now, how big are boards? Well, according to this research from mm and this year, the average number of people on a board is five and a half, and of, of those, 18% are female, 23% uh, of non-executives, so 18% of all board directors are female, 23% of non-executives are female. And what that means is it's probably a bit easier to get a job as a non-executive female at the moment than as an executive female, management as a woman. So um, this is slowly changing and the reason they're more percentage-wise non-execs on boards that are female is because the government is pushing very hard on this and they've held the threat over that they may bring in a law that says one third of all directors must by law be women. So all the companies think, oh bloody hell we better get one. In fact my first invitation to a company board was a chap that I knew quite well. I'd been a research consultant to his company and I'd worked for them for quite a few years as a research consultant, so we did very well. And it was a very successful company. And uh, in fact, one of the lovely bits of research he asked me to do, because he was in Scotland and I'd moved down to Portsmouth at the time, so we used to meet in London where I'd either design the next piece of research or interpret the last bit to him. And uh, so I had to arrange for us to meet over lunch and he would ask me to research the most expensive restaurant in London at the moment. So that was huge fun meeting up with him. Anyway, the way he invited me to come on the board was he said, well, my board have been having a talk about this women business. And we don't think they're going away. So we thought we'd better get one. Would you consider being it? So I said, oh, an invitation like that, how can I refuse? And, uh, and I did do it. And uh, it was a very enjoyable, very successful part of my career. I joined them when the share price was £3.45, and we sold the company when the share price was £10.88. And in company terms, that's a success. So that was good. So, however, although this says the average number is five, it's because they're all, all of these are... Um, private companies or public companies but they're all funded by share or, or investors. My experience in the kind of boards that I've had that you saw on the slide at the beginning, it's much more common to have about eight, eight to ten directors altogether, sorry, yeah eight to ten directors altogether and on every board there have to be more maybe only slightly more, but always more non-executives than executives. And the reason for that is that when it comes to a vote, because the non-execs are representing the shareholders and the stakeholders, they can always override the executive directors. And in fact, I've just been put on a board, the Portsmouth Historic Dockyard, where 
I haven't had my first board meeting yet, but I've already sussed out that a key part of my task, three non-execs were appointed at the same time as me, and with my casting vote, that gives us the, the advantage. Um, and I, I think that what I'm going to have to do to get started is overrule the executive directors who've been their donkey's years, because it's why the board has been changed by the chairman of these various trusts that are part of it, you know, the Victory, the Mary Rose, the Warrior, all that lot. So um, that's going to be fun. Um, so, what are the skills and behaviours that you need? Well, here they are, and they're ranked in order of importance. And I will just leave, leave you to read your way through that. Very important to be objective, very important to be independent. Very important to be able to challenge. Um, some experience may be add value, definitely. Common sense. There's a lot of skills here you people have got. And these are the most important ones. Objectivity, independence, able to challenge, common sense, mix of personality and skills. And uh, persistent. This is an important one. Persistence in pursuing a line of question in the face of majority view. When I'm talking to new um, directors uh, of any kind, whether they're exec or non-exec, um, when you think there's only maybe eight to ten people sitting around a board table, and if you've been properly selected, you're all different kinds of people. So that means there's a jolly good chance that no one around the board table thinks quite the same way you do. And you're sitting there because you're nervous, you're not very confident, and the argument's going, and you, you, there's a bit of the argument in your head, and no one has said it, and you think, your first thought will be, oh, no one said it, I must be wrong, I won't say it. Don't, don't, don't do that. The reason you are there is because you are the only person who represents your point of view. If there's something you want to say at a board meeting, Put your hand up and say it. And give your arguments and your reasons for saying it and you'll be surprised how often other people either not because you've said it or they will agree with you when you've given your reasons for saying it. But I always say when I'm doing work with people wanting to become non-executive, if you don't speak up at the board, you are wasting your space. And there's only eight to ten spaces. So if you feel, I haven't got the confidence to speak, speak up and you can't get training and support to do so, don't go, you're a waste of space. <laughs> so this is the first set of skills and then at less importance, able to get on with other directors but not over familiar. This is a business relationship, a business relationship. Um, you're not there to be chummy, you're not there to be mates, you're not there to go out to dinner. It's actually quite important not to be over familiar with the other people around the board table because otherwise people get in cahoots and there's little cliques in the board and it's not healthy for the board. The things you prize in the chairman above others are the objectivity and independence of your board and if they're all mates with each other they're all going to end up saying the same thing and again you've wasted space on the board. And then there are some more specific things under that. So, what do directors think their responsibilities are in order of importance? And they could rank them first, second and third only. And this is what came out. Strategy, most, most important. Performance. Scrutinise and monitor the performance of this board, of this company. Is it doing well? If it's not doing well, why not? Ask questions, ask for explanations and keep your eye on it and monitor it. And when you pipe up at one board meeting and say, what I think you ought to do about that is this, and all the other board members go, oh yeah, 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 we vote for that. So that's a decision made. What the executive directors have to do about that is this. At the next meeting, you should make sure that on the agenda, this is on the agenda, and the question can be asked, or should be asked before the meeting, how well have they got on with doing this, which was the decision made at the last meeting? And if it hasn't got started yet, why not? And if it hasn't got finished yet, why not? And 
So you, it's about it's about governing the organisation by scrutinising performance and monitoring performance. You have to ensure that your financial information is accurate and that the financial controls and systems of risk management are robust and defensible. Because if you've got duff numbers, you're going to come to duff decisions. So it's very important that board members satisfy themselves there are good financial information, good financial controls. That's usually done by, by a, a part of the board a committee called the Audit Committee, which has finance specialists on it, and they take responsibility for making sure that all the board members are getting good information. Ensure that the organisation as a whole is behaving properly. That's what corporate governance means. And not so important for the board is determining remuneration of executive directors and succession planning. Not because it's not important, but because that's not a big board issue. That's, on the whole, an operational issue. You need to keep an eye on it, but not decide. So, most important role is strategy and being able to challenge other board members. What is meant by that is if a board member says, I think we should do this because of blah, blah, and blah, you need to say, well, the way you should say it is rather than saying nonsense, which may be what you feel, you say, well, that's awfully interesting, but have you considered zip, zip, and zap? Uh, and because of zip, zip, and zap, I don't think blah, blah, blah is a very good way of doing it. I think we should consider zip, zip, and zap. So all the other board directors have now heard blah, 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 zip, zip, zap. And they have to start pitching in. And the chairman, if they don't pitch in, the chairman says, well, who thinks blah, blah, blah is the right thing to do? And if someone puts in, well, why do you think so? So you get a bit more information on the table. Well, who thought zip, zip, zip? And someone put in, why do you think it's zip, zip, zap? And so you keep, you, it goes constructive. So it's a challenge, but not a stand up and fisticuffs challenge. And it shouldn't be. The challenge ought to be an opportunity for the board to explore an issue from a number of points of view. So that's what's meant by challenging. And of course challenging can mean asking difficult questions like, why haven't you done it yet? And for an executive that could be quite a challenging question if they haven't done it. Um, and it is the right thing to do, because otherwise you're never going to get the performance up. Um, so a question arises, and this is the question asked in this questionnaire, if you do ask these challenging questions, do you get perceived as a difficult board member? Because you're always asking difficult questions. And the answer is you may do, but it's your job. If they're the right questions and the organisation can't give you good answers, I think I'm quite good at asking challenging questions and I absolutely love it when the exec zap back to me a very good answer because my only reason for asking the question was to find out if they knew the answer so it's it's not a negative thing it's a constructive thing to do just to make sure that they really do know what they're talking about and what they're talking to you about and uh, so are you likely to get marginalised? Because the chairman recognises that's your value on the board, is asking these tricky questions other people might feel uncomfortable about asking. But some people said, oh, well, you can get marginalised. You know, the chairman will never call on you to speak if he thinks, oh, well, she's got a hand up, that's going to be a tricky one. And they pass on to the next topic on the agenda. So are they effective, all these boards? Well, here's a lovely one. I had to pick this one out. Um, this is people sitting on boards, commenting about the boards they sit upon and saying how effective they think they are. Well, the chairman, they think they're awfully effective. The non-executives in smaller companies, only about 51% of them, think the board is actually working rather well. And even the highest numbers, only 70%. So that seems to be an awful lot of boards not working very well. Why not? What is it that, concern, that concerns non-execs in particular? What are they worried about? Firstly, about forcing a change of key personnel who are underperforming. 
it becomes very evident in the figures who, to the board members, it becomes very evident who are the non-performing executives. But it's not a non-executive's job to deal with that and either get them trained up or give them the sack. That's an executive job. And it's not a job that executives enjoy. Nobody enjoys having to talk to somebody who's not doing very well and telling them so. And firstly, giving them support to get better. And if they don't get better, say, well, I'm afraid you can't stay with us anymore. So it doesn't get done. And of course, the non-execs who don't have to do it always think it should be done quicker and faster and dealt with quicker, which I think is why the non-execs are saying their biggest worry is that underperforming personnel are not shifted out quickly enough, so they carry on doing damage to the organisation's performance. Second thing they're worried about is being able to influence the Chief Executive Officer. Chief Executive Officer, we've got him sitting here with us tonight, the Vice Chancellor of the University, I'm on his board. He thinks he's running the place. I'm on the board, I think I'm running the place. Um, he's paid to run the place, so I'm not paid anything. Uh, so why would he listen to me? Well, he'll find out. <laughs> um, being able to influence the chairman. And many non-execs obviously feel that the chairman doesn't listen to them. Well, that may be because the chairman doesn't agree with them, or the chairman also thinks, I'm the chairman, I don't have to listen to anybody. You do get, you know, every facet of, per of human personality is there in a boardroom. Um, insisting on corporate governance, executive directors often don't like corporate governance, especially in um, private companies, because they think it's a load of bureaucratic nonsense. Um, but it's up to the board and particularly the non-execs to make sure that the organisation as a whole performs well. Forcing a change of professional advisors. All firms are advised, all organisations are advised by all kinds of professional advisors. The most important probably being the financial advisors, the people who run your audit and give you financial advice. And they come in every year, they go through the company's books and they make a report to the board about how, this, how well the financial side of life is. And if they've been with the company long enough, because they come in and have to spend an awful lot of time with the finance department, the finance executives and the audit team become jolly, jolly chummy. And if it goes on for long enough, they become so chummy that the audit team then have difficulty in making critical reports to the board about these people who are now their friends. So it is very, very common, and if it doesn't happen here, it should do, that every three years you re-tender the audit contract because you do not want these people bedding in. And if the same company wins the contract again because they're a good company, then you demand that they change the partner who deals with your accounts. So you've got fresh people, because what you do not want is chumminess between an organization's advisors and its executives, because then the board is not getting independent advice anymore. The advisors are saying the same things the execs want to say, and you have to be vigilant to get an independent advice. Uh, where can you get independent advice from if you don't trust this whole lot? And the answer is the board should have the funds to pay for independent advisors of its own. That's happened on a couple of boards I'm in about legal advice where we've taken a separate legal advisor to ourselves from the one advising the company as a whole. Um, and you need some money for that and here they're worried about having the money. And the other thing is that the non-execs may want to talk to shareholders or the bankers and on the whole that's a job execs keep to themselves. So. They, those are the things, not worrying them a lot, only 7% said that, but you can see those are the worries. So how would you spend on all this stuff? Well, let's just look at the medium for now. In small companies, turnover of less than 10 million, about 12 days a year, one day a month. Big companies, a thousand million plus, that is a big company, billion pound turnover, um, 30 days a year. What's that, three days a month? Okay then, not a lot of time. What do you do with your time? Well, interestingly enough, if you're considering a board position, only about half your time is spent on board meetings. And by half your time spent on board meetings, they mean reading for a board meeting, 
You should see the size of the board minutes that come, the agendas that come out from here. So, you know, they can be that thick. It's a two days reading just to read the bloody papers, never mind make your mind up. Um, other things, you might be on a committee, audit or remuneration, that's how much everybody's paid. Uh, nomination committees, that's choosing who the next non-execs are going to be. Uh, and the reason I say that is because uh, the, code of co the corporate code of conduct says that non-execs may only serve for three years. They may have that term extended, usually for a maximum of three years. So they may only serve for an absolute maximum of nine years, though one of the boards I was on wouldn't let you do more than six. And so that means there's a continual churn in the board. And again, that's healthy because remember going back to the beginning, what we want is independence, objectivity, new fresh people bringing new fresh thinking. You want that all of the time. So you do get this churn, particularly in the non-exec directors of a board. And so a nominations committee means that every time you've got some gaps on your board, you do an analysis of what are the mix of skills we've got on the board, what's missing. And then when you go out looking for new nominations, you look for people with the skills that are missing. That's if you do it properly. Um, other committees, about 5% of time, and other things including being on the telephone to people, sending emails to people, and informal contacts. One of the things I like to do on all the boards I'm on is make relationships with particular directors inside the organisation, often at a variety of levels, and offer myself as a sort of advisor, sounding board, all the rest. And if, if they find that valuable, we carry on doing it, and I must say mostly people seem to. And if they don't find it valuable, I always leave it to them to arrange the meetings and say, if it's not helpful to you, don't arrange another meeting. It hasn't been the case so far, unfortunately, so some things I spend a lot of time on and some things I don't spend so much time on. But that's how the time is spent. How much money are we going to get for this? Well, the answer is, again, it depends on the size of the company. And uh, remember, the smallest company, we're only doing 12 <coughs> days a year, you're likely to get paid, what's that, about 8,000 to 18,000 pound a year. And as companies get larger, you're going to be paid between 42,000 and 60,000 a year. It varies whether they're a listed company, that's one you see in the paper, whether they're private equity backed, that means it's got somebody's private money in it, you'll never see it in the cut paper, it's a private company, they tend to pay a little bit more, and whether it's a, a general UK private company. Um, so, how do we get one, if we want one? And here's the answer. In a small company, and in fact in all companies, it is most likely to come through personal contact. Uh, for example, at the moment, I hope the university don't mind me using this example, but we have got some gaps on our board and we're looking for some new non-executives. So all of the board members have been invited to put names forward. Well, you aren't going to put forward the name of anyone you don't even know. So, personal contact, terribly, terribly important. We'll come back to that. Um, the size, depending on the size of the company, very large companies, I'm looking at the pink now, are likely to use executive search consultants. The headhunters, as they're often called. About 75% of all vacancies are never, ever advertised. They're given to executive search consultants. Executive search consultants only put forward the names of people they know, and how they get to know names is to phone up people like me they know already, and say, we're looking for this, you interested? If you say no, they say, give me some names. So it's all about these names passing around in a hat. We'll come back to the importance of that. Uh, an advisor introduced, well, that's if Maybe there's a particular problem with your finances and your financial advisor says to you, well, here's somebody who uh, is really good. They might be useful on your board. So it might happen like that. Um, and then you know, there's others. So that's how we get on. So how do we get on? How do you get your knees under the boardroom table? Well, step one, and this is, I'm talking to students now. Step one, create the business you. 
and that means dress for success. Look the part if you want the boardroom. You've got to look like someone who is at home in the boardroom. And my experience certainly is that for women that means skirt suits. It's not essential, it's not necessary, but when you are early on in your non-executive life, looking the part is just tremendously, tremendously important. Why? Because 80% of people make up their mind about you in the first 30 seconds of meeting you. And students sometimes say to me, I used to lecture in a university myself, and students would say to me, but I'm awfully nice when you get to know me. They ain't going to get to know you if you don't look the part. You've got to look like someone they could see comfortably sitting on there. An important part of managing a board as the chair is having a group of people that can certainly challenge each other, but are comfortable with each other. So that's about looking the part. Now you know how to look the part. When you go to the gym you know what to wear, when you go to the nightclub you know what to wear, when you play sport, every sport's got a different uniform. The business uniform is suits for men and women and ties too for men. Until you've had your knees under that boardroom table for long enough for everybody to feel comfortable with you. Maybe you could loosen your tie a bit then, but I don't recommend it because it says, hey, I'm slackening off here. Um, so, dress for success. Get the clothes to go with it. And if I may make an utterly inappropriate sexist remark, I'm going to say to the girls, I beg of you, don't ever get yourselves a black trouser suit. It might as well have secretary written on it in neon lights. <laughs> if you want to get under the board table, get yourself a skirt, please. Um, next one, and terribly politically correct <coughs> me to raise it, but I think it's important. Speak for success. Work on your business voice. I grew up in South London, and I speak something like this is my natural own speaking. I was blessed with a mother who sent me to elocution classes. Now, I don't speak very plummily, but I have what is called a received standard English accent, utterly clear to <coughs> anybody. It came, this word received pronunciation came out of the BBC in the beginning, because when the BBC first set it up back in the midst of time, and it's publishing to the whole country, broadcasting to the whole country, we have tremendous variation in the country, as you know. Have you ever tried to understand what someone called, coming from Geordieland is saying? Or even a broad Scots person? You won't make head or tail of it. They might as well be speaking a foreign language. So, what received pronunciation did was to give people a standard way of speaking that you could understand if you lived in Scotland or Northumberland or Cornwall or Norfolk or anywhere where the extreme accents are. And that became received English, received pronunciation. Now I know in this university they do tons of language classes in every language you can think of and I've been pointing <coughs> away without success so far I think to get them to run classes in received pronunciation because I think that is as important to you in getting a job, never mind a boardroom position, as getting a 2-1 or a first is. It's part of the business kit. If you <coughs> want to go work in Canary Wharf, you have to look like it, you have to sound like it. Or you just won't get the job and you know, won't know why because no one will tell you because we're not allowed to talk about this sort of thing. So it is my gift to you that I am talking about this most important thing. Next one, this is a new one from about two weeks ago. Take care with Facebook and Twitter. I expect you all heard about that girl Paris who the police decided they'd have on their board as an advisor about relationships with young people and then it turns out that on her Facebook and Twitter she's been doing racist remarks, anti-homosexual remarks, you know, the kind of things you shouldn't say. It'll come and bite you. You are young now, but the higher up the chain you get, 
people gunning for you are going to trawl your Facebook and Twitter site to see what they can find damaging about you and your views. And if you don't want that to follow you, and it can follow you, your whole career, you can't get rid of that stuff, that nonsense you've put on, you can't get rid of it. Stop doing it. And same with Twitter. If you, I used to work for the London Docklands Development Corporation, very, very political. We were the organization all the press loved to hate. Any story they could get to damage the corporation, they'd get it. And I sort of trained myself in that period. If you wouldn't like to see your remarks written on page one of the Times, don't make them. Or at least don't write them down. You, of course, talk to people, talk to your mates, you can say what you like. But written down stuff, which is Facebook and Twitter, if they're damaging remarks, will come back and damage you. Next thing, impression management. Right, we want to get to the board, we want people to know that. There's a lovely lady here, I hope will forgive me, for using her as an experience. She went today to a most important lunch. And uh, she came in all excited to tell the wonderful Aranjita, who's done all these slides for me, um, about what a fabulous time she'd had in this business meeting. I said, you didn't go like that, did you? Here she is in these little skinny jeans. Very pretty girl, beautiful looking, and, you know, pretty well dressed for a student. But really, if she wants to go whizzing up the top skirt, and she said, I always wear a skirt. It's only today I didn't do it. So it's rotten for her that I've not only spotted her, but also used her as an example. So thank you and forgive me. So you've got to work on the impression that you're giving to other people. Remember that stuff, about 30 seconds, 80% of the impression is made. Look the part. Look the part all the time. Every time, well, no, there's been a few exceptions, and I always feel dreadful about them. Every time I come to the university, I wear a skirt suit or a skirt and jacket or a skirt and dress. Um, and I have been here once or twice in a trouser suit, but that's certainly as low as I'd go, and it wasn't a black one. Um, <laughs> and it's because when I come to this university, I come in as one of your board of governors. I want to look like one of your board of governors. It is my gift to you that I'm looking what I think one of your board of governors should look like. If you want to be on the board, start looking like it. You could start looking like it any old day. What you'll find is all your mates will rib you like crazy. What are you all dressed up for, they'll say. And the reason they're going to do that to you is they want to pull you back down into their comfort zone. Because wearing the right kind of clothes immediately says, I'm dressing for the boardroom, not for you. My office in those years when it was popular, they had this dress down Friday. And they're all in jeans and scruff bags and trainers. And I never did that. I always went in my suit. And one of the guys said to me one day, why do you dress like that? It's Friday. It's dress down Friday. I don't dress for you. I dress for the customers I see and the people I meet and the people outside the organisation. I'm not dressing for you lot scruff bags in here. And all the time it's about impression. How do you look? High performance. You've got to be a high performer. You don't just get these jobs for not being very good at what you do anyway. You've got to be good at what you do anyway. But let people know that. So if you are in a company or wherever you are and you've had a success, you've done something it's come out well, send emails around about it to your boss, to people who matter to you, say, I just thought you'd like to know that I did this little project and this happened. Let them know. How are they to know about your little private successes if you don't tell them? And if they don't know about your successes, they're not going to think of you as promotion material. So a lot of this advice I'm giving you doesn't just take you in the boardroom. It'll do very well in your career and let your ambition be visible. Let people know that you're intending to go higher than you are now. Why do that? It's in, in England, it's a terribly embarrassing thing to be ambitious. Oh my God, especially if you're a woman. Don't go there. Ambition is good, it's important. It'll get you loads of good things in life. Celebrate it, thank your lucky stars you've got it, and tell other people you've got it. Say, what well, I'm going to be one day is this. I want to get on a board one day, and so I'm doing that. And let people know I'm a person going place, because then they think, cool, 
that's a person going places. I mean, actually, impression management is quite easy. If you say to people often enough, oh, I'm going places, I think, she's going places. And then they'll pass it, oh, did you know she's going places? She's going places. And whoosh, you're going places, and you probably are. Because the people who have the chance to give you steps up think, ah, there's somebody that we should give this next position to, because they're going places. Um, manage upwards, so whoever's upwards in your authority structure, whether it's your lecturers or your senior manager at work or the boss above that, let them know. Man you know, make relation pleasant relationships with them so they know how you are and you know, occasionally they know how you're doing and you just gotta keep keep people comfortable with you as somebody performing well and wanting to make it. And you think we all start out like that, me too. Well, I am still, but you wouldn't know it. How to build your confidence. Well, I had the great good fortune once to be put on board by <coughs> Lord Henderson. He's dead now, but he was one of the top, top, top industrials of his day. Huge, both in the UK and in America. The top business person. And I got put on one of his little teeny weeny boards, but it was a board and he did chair it. And of course, over the few years that I was on that board, when he got what he wanted out of me, I only got one term. Um, but um, for the few years I was on that board, of course, I was experiencing how he operated and how he worked now. And I thought, wow, that is one smooth operator. And so he is now my role model. Now, the reason I say invent role model, because it means when I'm in a situation and I'm not sure what to do, or how to behave, I think to myself, what would Lord Hanson do if he was in this position? When I think that, I know immediately what he'd do, and I can do it. He probably wouldn't do it if he was there in my situation, but the fact I think he would gives me enormous confidence in doing it or saying it, or whatever it is. So pick yourself a role model where you think, that's what I really want to be, or invent one. And Keep it in your head, and whenever you come across those situations in which you don't feel confident, think, what would this uber-confident, capable person you know do? And you'll find you know what that is, and you can do it. You mustn't tell anybody, that. that's my big secret. <laughs> right, so, start small. Practice your skills. Where do you begin if you're a student? The answer is you could get on a student's union and get on a committee that interests you. Of whatever topic it is. Or you could join a club that interests you and get on that committee. Or if you have charitable interests, find a small the library, you'll find all the local charities and go to some charity that interests you and ask if you can go on their committee after volunteering for a while, of course. Ask to go on the Board of Governors at your old school or a local school. They'll be thrilled to have you. Um, school, school governors, they're always hard up for governors. It's a great place to practice your skills. Ask to shadow a board member, a member of any board, you know, ask if you can shadow them, see what it's like. Just ask to go and sit on a board, behind a board, to observe a board for the day, or sorry, for, the, for a meeting. You could, for example, we could introduce it by rotation, we could invite a couple of students to each of the board meetings at UEL, and you could just sit in the back and observe how a board meeting works and decide whether it's the kind of thing that would suit you. Of course, from a career point of view, the best way into the boardroom is to become a manager and work your way up to director level and so on. But get your name known. That's really the most important thing. Get your name known. Serve on committees, make presentations. Oh, I can't do a presentation. I bloody well learn to. There's courses here in this university. Do it. Do it. First time you do it, your knees will be knocking, you'll be terrified. I'm terrified about this, I've never done this before, this particular one to this particular audience. I'm terrified. Actually, <coughs> good oh, because I'm racing with adrenaline. Ever so good for your performance. One of those very famous actors, was it John Mills, somebody like that, um, or Ralph Richardson, used to be sick behind the wings every time he went on stage. And he was one of our top actors. And right to the end of his career, he was sick just before he went on stage because he was so nervous. But that what made him such a good actor. So don't worry about nerves. Feed off the adrenaline. 
and learn to make presentations in little audiences. You, you're doing this all the time in the university, making presentations. Make sure you're the next one who volunteers to do the presentations. They're scuttling to the back and not looking when they say, who's going to do the presentation? It's got to be you. Practice it, because this is a safe audience to do it in front of. And then the more you do, you know, the easier it becomes. You find you can do it. It's not really that very hard. The easiest thing to do is have your notes all ready and follow it through. Think about it. Prepare, 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 prepare. Very important. And normally, the reason this one's difficult for me is the kind of things I talk about are very pictorial. If it's about tourism or destination management or London Docklands, I get loads and loads and loads of fabulous photographs. So people are riveted on the screen and not looking at me. Um, so, make presentations, make speeches. Start in a small way, work your way up. Look at your CV. Does a CV look like somebody going places, getting to the board? Remember, it's not executive. You don't have to do anything. This is about strategic thinking, judgment. So, practice your strategic thinking, brush up your finance, get training. You're in the right place for that. And ask advice all the time. You've got a fabulous <coughs> set of lecturers here. Ask them. Talk to other board members, get to meet them, I'll tell you how in a minute. If you've got particular company interests, target the company that you're interested in. If you're in a company, your own company, if you're other companies, look them up on the web. It's so easy nowadays. Meet relevant headhunters, so that means finding out who they are. How do you find out who they are? Get the Sunday Times and go to the appointments pages and half, if not more, of the ads in there are all put in by headhunters because they're trying to find heads they don't know and skills they don't know and at the bottom of the ad the job will be way beyond you but at the bottom of the ad it will have the name of the search firm and you contact the firm and say look I'm a student I'm interested in this can I come talk to anyone can I send you my CV can you give me some advice and some of them will most 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 important network 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 put yourself a belt Put yourself about. The, we've come against this word of mouth time and time and time again. You need to know people who are on boards or know people. How do you get to know them? You turn up at stuff where business people are. And you put the word around and you use every opportunity. Here's an idea. If you're really serious, you might um, become a student member of the Institute of Directors. Um, I'm not going to go into that link now because Ranjita who set me up, it's at the bottom of the screen and I can't see it anymore. Um, but anyway, I haven't got time because I'm racing through time and I would like you to ask me some questions. So that's a great place to start. If you're already a manager, join the Institute of Directors as a manager. They're not all directors. It's a great place to meet other managers, to go to interesting seminars. They always give you a drink afterwards, um, <laughs> unlike tonight. Um, and then, <laughs> uh, but also they have advice and support for six, however many you want to meet. And then you go to the person behind the desk giving out the badges and you say, is this person here? That's easy to work out. All you've got to do is look at the desk. If their name is still there, the answer is no. You can do that for yourself. If, the, if their name tag is gone, they are here. So you say to the girl behind the desk, could you point this person out to me please? And the girl behind them, if they always know who's there, because they're the membership manager and they know everybody and everybody knows them, and so they will point. So you make your way over there and then you go and say, oh, how awfully interesting to talk to you. I won't take up too much of your time, but I do appreciate talking to me. Do you know who this person is? And off you go to the next one. It's important to have a good outline when you network. I was hopeless at that when I first started networking. I get kind of trapped with people. And I think, I've had enough, I've met you, I want to meet somebody else. But I didn't know how to move on. And I got mego, have you heard that phrase? M-E-G-O, my eyes glazed over. <laughs> <laughs> Theirs probably did as well, because they were no better at saying cheerio than me. So you need little lines to say, oh, thank you so much for talking, I'd love talking to you. And move on. Find what, the most important bit of networking I find is getting out and getting on <laughs> to meet somebody else. So, it's your moment. Any questions? Well, you all had to think of one at the beginning, so there should be a lot. Oh dear. <laughs> Come on, Ranjita and Maria. You were told you had to. Let's have it. Speak up. I can't hear a word of that. I'm better supposed to. I've got a question. 
Yeah. My question to you is how did you, um, after you made your first step up, how long after did you, how, did, how long did it take you to make your second step up after you've got to? It doesn't the take long. Getting your foot in the door is the hardest It's thing. the hardest part. Um, and I just <coughs> wish someone had spoken to me like this when I was as young as some of you are, because I didn't even know about boards and stuff like that. I got my first one when I was about 26, I think, and it was a governor of a girls' school. And uh, you go along, all shaking in fear, at least I did, and there are all these people, and they're mostly old duffers, councillors. They haven't read the papers. I'm very conscientious. I've always read the papers. Um, they haven't read the papers, they have nothing to say. If they open their mouths, we're just bloody windbags. And I thought, hey, I could do this. And uh, the head teacher thought I was a star on her board. And I was. And, you know, it was something very close to my heart being a girls' school. I passionately believe in girl only education. Because if it's mixed education, then girls learn. You're not supposed to do maths, you're not supposed to do physics, you're not supposed to do this, that, and the other. Whereas in a girls' school, it's just A and other subject. If you're good at it, you're good at it, and if you're not, you're not. Anyway, I was very happy to serve on this board. I then got one as uh, on the board of the governors of the art college in the area I was in. I don't know anything about art, and uh, I'm no good at it either. Um, but. I had by then, I understood what being on a board was, I understood what they needed, and I can do that. It won't surprise you to know. I can speak up very merrily upon almost any subject at almost any moment. And as for having a whole pile of papers leading me on the subject that I'm invited to speak up upon, I now have no problem doing that at all, unfortunately, as John has learned to his cost. Um, so then, oh, I don't know, it's just, uh, you know, a whole variety. Then it just one thing led to another, and then I was in a business career, and you heard how my first big board um, appointment came about to fill in this woman's slot because they weren't going away, and then you know it just sort of rollicks after that. And I, as you know, I've just picked up another one only last month as chairman of Portsmouth Historic Dockyard, which is the Mary Rose, the Victory, the Warrior, all those wonderful things. If you haven't been down to see it, you must come down and see it. But not yet, because the Mary Rose is opening a new museum, not until the end of this month. And I don't know if you know the story of the Mary Rose. How many of you know, heard of the Mary Rose? Some of you have. And the Mary Rose is a ship, a 15th century ship, went down in the Solent while King Henry VIII was watching her. She sank in soft mud. 30 years ago, some divers started bringing bits of it, and a whole half a ship came up because it was soft mud. In the intervening years, they have been washing the water out, putting in resin, and they've done all that. So they're now drying out what is now a resin filled ship, so it would collapse. If you let it dry, it just collapse, you know, like those zombie films you see, like, <laughs> where, the, where the skeleton comes out the tomb, and as soon as it hits the air, it collapses. Well, that's what would happen to the Mary Rose if you let it get dry. Anyway, she's now full of resin. They've set her up behind, uh, she's still in a box, she's got to dry for five years. So you can see the, the actual ship there. On this side, they have built a replica ship and all the artifacts that used to be in the museum, they've got about 26,000 there. They're all in the ship where they would have been. Absolutely thrilling. So anyway, let it get open. It'll be very, very busy early in the summer, but maybe autumn time, that'll be your moment. Any other questions? Yes. Um, how many, how many um, non-paid committees did you need to be on before you got your first paid committee? And was that uh, well, the answer often? is that the question was how many unpaid before you get a paid one. And the answer is there's a, a number of reasons for starting on unpaid ones. First of all, not surprisingly, they're easier to get. And secondly, that's where you hone your skills and you discover what your strengths are. Now, you've got the list of what your strengths need to be. So, you know, you, you assess your own performance on a board, work out what you're good at, where you're weak, get training where you think you're weak, and build up your confidence. And, and once you've got a few of those under your belt, then you can start applying for paid for ones. And I would do that now, which I would never even heard of them then, by going through the executive search consultants and saying, look, I've got all this experience in this area. Um, are there any a paid executive roles likely to um, be suitable for me. The other thing to do is there's a, 
a government website called Public Appointments. Look it up on the government website, just Google Public Appointments and, and it'll come up the government website and they have to put all of the board appointments all of the time on that website. You'll be astonished how many there are every time you look it up. There's loads of them. And uh, start popping in a few applications, making them as good as you can, and when you don't get one, which will happen in the early, early goes, you then phone up the headhunter and say, I wonder if you could tell me what were the strengths and weaknesses of my application. They have to tell you. It's the code of executive search consultants. They have to give feedback. That is your learning experience. So take it. Never don't get selected and don't find out why. So that's how you work it up. Yes, there's one. Well done, Maria. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I was just, I'm just giving other people a couple of minutes to see. Um, what do you think, uh, what's your opinion on uh, boardroom quotas for women? On boards and? Bo quotas, all female shortlists. Uh, for women, and <coughs> do you think with Vince Gable taking the voluntary approach, we're going to achieve uh, a, no, a, a, a decent number of women on boards ever? I think it's a tremendously important initiative, and the reason I think so is clear from what I've said. The way you get on boards is knowing people are on boards, and it's very easy for boards to replicate themselves. And since our major quoted companies have traditionally been run by chaps, you know, from the old, the old boys club, uh, it was not surprising. They, there's a lot of, uh, I think they're called pale, pale grey males um, on boards. And they know other pale grey males because you tend to mix with people like yourself. So when the remunerator, someone in the governance committee says, do you know anyone for the board? They'll come up with another pale grey male. So, um, Getting in isn't that easy for women because their circle of old whale grain <laughs> males uh, may not be that strong. So uh, I think it's an important initiative. I don't think it should be a law, but I think keeping up the pressure, and it is working. I mean, when they started that, not him, but it was started quite a long time ago, there were about 7% of women on boards. We're now up to 23%. Now that's moving in the right direction. But it's non-executive. It's non-executive. It's non-executive, yeah. Executive, the way to get an executive directorship is you've got to get into a company and then you've got to do well in it. And you've got to want to go all the way up to the top. I mean, I've got slightly mixed feelings about that because um, I chose not to have a family and I'm thrilled. It was a fabulous decision. Being with other people's children is just so reinforcing, I cannot tell you. So for me, it was a brilliant decision and it's worked. But it has mean, meant I've been able to have this fabulous career, all of which has been enormous fun that John talked about earlier on. Um, if you're trying to bring up a family, I've already said I'm very conscientious. If I was bringing up a family, I don't know whether I could have done all that, you know, done it all, had it all. So I do understand the pressures, and if you choose, I'd rather be with my family than get up the greasy pole, well, I think that's a perfectly valid decision, so long as the opportunities are there to get up the greasy pole. So I don't think we'll ever be 50-50 executive directors, because I think many women, more than men probably, the main caring, the main domestic stuff is still with women. Um, however new men they think they are, they're never that new that they actually take responsibility for it. Um, so I think for women it's a much more difficult, you've just got to make your own decision, what works for you, what's good for you. And, and so when you're in a management career, uh, that's a personal decision. In fact the reason, funnily enough, when I was about 30 or just coming up to it, the reason I switched from you know, quite a good executive career at the time into working for what's now Portsmouth University because I thought, oh, 30, the, what do they call it? The genetic time bomb or whatever it is. You know, if we're going to have a family, better do it. So my husband and I, and I went out to have a drink. We always used to go out to a pub to have a chat because at home it's all kind of pass assault and mechanical stuff. So we went out to the pub and said, you know, what about this family thing? 
<laughs> so uh, my husband said, I let him speak first, you'll be surprised to know, um, but I thought it was quite important to know what he really, really thought. He said, well, to be honest with you, he was a deputy head teacher at the time, he said, any paternal feelings I've got are thrashed out of me between nine and four every day. I don't want to come home for some more, if you really want to know what I think. And I said, yippee, because I don't want to come home to any at all. So let's make that the decision, live with it for a year, and we'll come. And I wrote it in my diary. And a year later, we had to go and check that nobody had any little broody regrets. And that's when we shared with each other how wonderfully reinforcing other, other people's children were on this excellent decision that we'd made. And even now, you know, when we're with my nieces and nephews, you go, really out of housing. How can they live like that? So, um, but it's got to be your own decision. So it's one I took, but in full knowledge, it's got to be done thoughtfully. It's got to work for your life as well. Just following on from that, I just wondered how important you thought the use of language was. I know a number of decades ago we used to think changing language, so to say chair rather than chairman. Oh yes. And make sure he and she rather than just he. But I noticed you've used chairman, so I yes, just I wondered have. if you thought it, it was important in terms of changing perceptions. Um, like, no, was the answer. Uh, I take the view, if the title of the job is chairman, and that's what they're offering, I want to be a chairman. And this latest job, it was advertised as chairman, and I got it. And then the PA that I've got down there said to me very nervously, what do you want us to call you? Do you want to call chairwoman? <laughs> Chair? Or, you know, what do you want to be called? <laughs> so um, I said to her, well, what do you think I should be called? So she said, well, I don't like chair. How can we put out a press release saying, oh, Portsmouth Historic Dockyard's got a new chair? <laughs> <laughs> Good point, you may um, Plus, um, all, you know, the, the chairman of the Victory, the Mary Rose, and all that lot, who are all my, you know, my, my partner, my funding partners, um, you know, they're all on the old white pale male route and uh, to them a chairman's a proper job and a chair that you know that's some modern politically correct thing not quite cutting the mustard so uh, I took this PA's advice and I call myself chairman and everybody knows what that means and I'm it because I don't regard it as a gender description I regard it as a job description but that's entirely personal I know a lot of people who think that isn't how you should think but it's how I think I'll be a chair if they want me to be a chair. I'll be a chair if they want me to be a chair. I won't be a chairwoman. I think that's dreadful. That, you know, that's just dreadful. I'm not fat enough. I haven't got pearls or two. <laughs> I've thoroughly enjoyed your presentation, and I think it's very inspiring. And, I, and you, students need to hear this so much more. Um, I mean, I, I actually have been a gov school governor, and I have colleagues here are also school governors. I never made the. Tr I never thought about transferring my skills to becoming. A board a board member of a company, which is interesting. That's something new. But I'm also, but I'm, I haven't for many years been a trustee of a small uh, charity in Walton oh. Forest, and we are always looking for trustees. Okay. Um, so if anybody needs them, here we are. We're networking already. But that's again, it's true. it's an opportunity. Right. I know um, it is true. So, so if you have, to, you've got yeah. to. Don't take anything you're not interested in. If it's a charity doing stuff you couldn't care tuppence about, and you think they're wasting other people's money doing it, like anything green, that would be me, don't get yourself involved with it. If your heart's not in it, don't do it. It's got to be something you really care about. And a lot of these charities are doing the most fabulous work. And they're always looking, and they need help. And you can begin, all of you can begin, by finding a charity that interests you, and going and working with them a bit as a volunteer, getting, a, getting under their skin. What do they do? What are the people like? You know, is this something I want to help with a bit of my life juice? Am I willing to donate a bit of my life juice, which also, as it happens, will donate to me in return some very useful experience and something to put on my CV? Papering the CV, the important. And papering it not only with the job title, but with the skills you developed there. So, in your case, 
you know, if you're now going for public companies, you know, I've been a trustee on such a board and here I've developed my strategic skills, my ability to read the finances, to contribute, to be independent, you know, all the words that are in that, you know, whack them all back at them on your CV. Yes. Uh, I'll take this one first. Um, well, talking about gender um, early on, do you did you ever think that you were not taken seriously when you were on a board because, well, from other from other board members because uh, you were a woman? The answer is, other board members are far too polite to let you know that, and that may be the case. It certainly was the case with this Scottish board I went on, where you know they were making up the numbers because they felt they had to, and it was perfectly obvious that some of the old lairds who were there, and they were fan they were red hot, that is, the one, one an old lags board, they were red hot people that I am privileged to have worked alongside, but you, you know, I felt that they, it's up to you. After the first meeting, all of that went because I could interact with them, I could make sensible contributions, they answered them, and it goes. So it might be there when you start it's up to you. One of the things they say about women, and I guess it's still partly true, if a man goes for a job, everyone assumes he can do it till he proves otherwise. If a woman goes for a job, everyone assumes she can't do it till she proves otherwise. So you've got to try harder, and that's why mostly women are better. <laughs> it's my experience. <laughs> Being unbiased, as I am. <laughs> any barriers? Uh, yes, oh yes, there's I'm barriers sure all the way for when I, wo I move. I always say to women when I'm, when I'm talking to groups of women, mostly about careers, you get to a place where you think there's a barrier and it's to do with you, you know, your sex, move. You haven't got enough life to bash your head against their brick wall. There's loads of places where your talent could go. Don't waste your time on them if they haven't got the common sense to see your skills. There's two kinds of boss. I've forgotten, I used to have all these little catchphrases when I used to give these talks, I haven't given one for years. But one type is gardener. Gardeners work with the people below them and grow them into something better. Hoarders, that's my other word, hoarders, have someone who's really good below them. Someone that's a bloke said this to me just the other day about this uh, executive on the new uh, company I'm going to and she's really really good but really really good and I said I had a meeting I've met all the executives now and I said this this guy is really really good he said yes don't tell her I don't want her to leave <laughs> so if you know you're really really good and other feedback will tell you that um, then it may be time to move this is a very small organization I haven't got a problem with good people using it as a stepping stone because they make a fabulous contribution and then they move on. Good oh, and you've got friends whizzing up wherever they whiz up to. Um, and you've, it's up to you to choose someone good to come back in again. Hanging on to people till you know, they're old or bitter, um, it's not good for you and it's not good for them. So if I'm in that situation where I just think, oh, they're never going to do this. Well, when I applied for this job, I never thought they'd give it to a woman. I applied because I would absolutely love to have had it. But in my day, when I was down in Portsmouth as an executive director, these kind of jobs were all given to ex-admirals. Uh, so I didn't even think I'd get shortlisted, no one selected. So there's some sort of kind of wind blowing out there. <laughs> sorry, just to follow up on the Oh, sorry, I'm just going to hold that, because there was you. Somebody up there wanted one. Uh, yeah, just, well, just a quick one. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> can you be passionate during a meeting? How much passion Can you be you passionate? Yeah, you have to bring, you know, if you strongly feel it. I think it's more difficult if you're the chairman. Non-exec can be passionate as long as they can be articulate and explain why they're passionate. Passion and emotion don't really have a useful place in a boardroom. But if you think something is so important and you can articulate it, with arguments rather than just emotion, then I think that can be helpful. But it, you know, emotion isn't the way to persuade other people. You know, I really care about this. <laughs> 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 I really care. <laughs> I don't think that's going to do it. <laughs> Sorry, just to carry on with the barriers, because um, 
as a woman, I know I find it hard, but as a black woman, I find it even more harder. And I've noticed this. More difficult? My, yeah, more difficult. Watch that language. I've noticed, <laughs> I've noticed this in, in my name as well, because my name's Emilita, and I have to say Emma to get any job into yeah. I say Emilita, I don't. Yeah. So do you think there's barriers to be? I'm sure there are, and you found a way around it, use it. But then, because I don't share my whole name, yeah. when they see me, it's kind of a different story. So do you think that? Well, I think, I, well, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is, but I would do what you're doing. At least get yourself in front of them. Um, they have to give you an interview then, and then you have to perform well. I think you need to brush up your language and maybe what you wear. Not a flower in your hair, for example. <laughs> <laughs> you know, do you look like a serious business person? No, you enjoy that. <laughs> It's the night time. <laughs> Tip in the day. <laughs> I, I don't mind what you all wear any time. I'm just giving you my advice about how I think you should look. I don't know how you looked when you went for these interviews. Um, you've got a lovely lady here called Femi Bowler who runs the employability staff. And I went to one of her talks to students. It was absolute hoot. She <coughs> says to students, when you're emailing to companies, don't use your email address at sexyhotpants.com. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, good tip. <laughs> so, <coughs> just keep giving it a go, you'll get there. Do a bit of volunteering, is my advice. Get your way in through charities, prove yourself as a valuable board member somewhere. Then you've got a reference. Yeah, um, what would be the uh, career plan becoming a non-executive director? And obviously, to develop your career, what, what, what would your career plan be? What's the end goal? Well, the end goal is a portfolio career. It's the sort of thing you do at the end, when you've made a fabulous success of your executive career, then you pick up non-executives. But if you've left it till then, it'll be very hard to do. You should try and pick up a few on the way, and certainly pick up the skills on the way. And really, the, the end game is to be a portfolio director on three or four of these companies which are paying 60k a year so you can get 120k for max 36 days a year sounds good to me toddle off on your boat in between miles. and the things you, you care about you can make that for me the satisfaction is putting your life juice into making things happen you care about you know, I'm not necessarily passionate at the boards I'm on, but I'm passionate about <coughs> the organisations whose boards I'm on. There was something over there, Catherine. And then I've got one up the back. You've been introduced. Um, just mention that you're very keen, you're very passionate about transformation and uh, regeneration. Yeah. And then during your talk as well, you talked about sometimes a board has to refresh itself. Yes. In terms of applying that concept to you as an individual, do you find, did you find it necessary to refresh your own self, to regenerate your oh, own yes. self? Oh, and yes. And how did you go about it? Well, this career. I was interviewed once by a, a lady from the Financial Mail on Sunday, and she put this thing, this article out that said, this woman has reinvented herself more times than Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, if you look at my CV, I'm reinventing it all the time. What kind of things do you do in terms of refreshing, reinventing yourself? Just well, just take a new challenge, look in a new direction, think about, you know, is there something else that I want to do that I haven't done yet? Yeah. And then go for it. If there's nothing you want to do, don't do it. You don't have to do this. There was a question right at the back there. I was just going to ask, um, regarding interviews, um, during interviews I've been advised by several people about appearance, communication and things like that. And um, someone said to me in particular that when you are going for an interview, avoid being very passionate. So don't be too subtle nor relaxed, and don't be overly passionate and um, enthusiastic, because um, the person you're speaking to might be better than you, or obviously you might be more skilled than them. So based on how you come across, they might see you as a um, as a um, threat to their job, <laughs> things like that. So you know, it's just. How do you get a balance around? How do you know well, what Well, first of all, if you're going for an interview, I think it's safe to assume that the person who's interviewing you knows more than you do, especially at your time of life. Um, so I don't think we need to worry about 
whether you're going to be a threat to your interviewer. Uh, however, if you have special skills, I think it's terribly important to prepare for any interview you go to. You should have studied the website, you should know what they're looking for, study the ad if there was an ad, or ask at the interview what particular skills are you looking for, and that's your opening to explain where you have experience in those areas. I've done tons of interviewing and including university graduates, and what I find happens too often is that people come in and tell me why they want this wonderful job, because what it'll do for their career. I don't blinking care about that. What are they going to do for my company? So think about yourself from the interviewer's point of view. What is a little package of skills, experience, enthusiasm that you want to contribute to that company? And those are the things you could talk about. But you can get cl clues by saying to the interviewer first, it'd be very helpful to me to know exactly what kind of skill set you're looking for. Often you'll find that interviewers haven't prepared themselves very well, and you can ask them these bloody good questions, and it just throws them all a heap. Um, and so if, if they mumble away a bit, then you say, well, I think my particular strengths are blah, 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 blah. They'll always ask you, what are your weaknesses? That is a tricky one. Um, I'm, <laughs> I've tried a number of answers to that. Uh, I've tried, I really can't think of any, because I think it's not my job to tell you what's no good about me. Um, that doesn't go down terribly well. Um, <laughs> and I've, I've, I've tried, oh, I'm over-conscientious. It's quite a nice one. <laughs> in fact, my brother-in-law went for an interview last night, and I was chatting to him over the weekend. And they asked him what his weaknesses are. So he said, I get so involved with my job, I tend to take it home with me in the evening. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, think about it and think about a good answer. Every interview you ever go for will ask you what your strengths are. You're always prepared for that. What are your weaknesses? And what are you going to say your weaknesses that aren't going to scupper your chances? Think about it. Prepare. I think I probably have to stop. But it's been enormous fun. Thank you for making it so easy. I think.